type of urium. Okay, uh, there are only 25. I think we should wait for uh, till 9 or 10 a.m. when further students uh, join the class. Abnormal perperium. So first we'll look what are the learning objectives. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to define perperium. The physiology of normal perperium, we should know what is a normal physiology, what are the abnormalities during perperium. And we'll be discussing about the disease of perperium and the management and treatment of disease. Okay. So starting with what is perperium? Can anybody uh, answer it in the chat box? Okay, I've shown it. It's a six weeks period following childbirth. Soon after delivery, this period starts. And for the first six weeks, we call it a perperium. Okay, the reproductive tract returns to its normal pre-pregnancy state. During perperium, what happens at the reproductive tract as the uterus is, uh, uh, it is a pelvic organ, but it increases in size and become an abdominal uh, organ and uh, so uh, uterus uh, is uh, I think enlarged in the zephy sternum so the reproductive tracts returns to its normal pre-pregnancy state like it becomes shrinking shrink, sh it shrinks and uh, it become a pelvic organ during this phase okay the in This is the most critical period for a female. Okay. The mother is vulnerable to psychological disturbance, difficulty in, in coping a newborn. So this is the phase where the mother is psychologically disturbed as well. Okay. And major morbidities occur during this phase. So this is the first six weeks period following childbirth. So you should know the definition of a period that is a six weeks period following childbirth. And what happens in this? The reproductive tracts returns to its normal pre-pregnancy state. Okay. Like in Urdu, we call it Sava Mahina. So this is that phase, the perperium. Okay. We'll be dealing with physiology of normal perperium. Okay. So uh, there is uterine involution. What happens in the normal perperium that there is uterine involution. Okay. What happens in is the process by which postpartum uterus of 1 kg returns to its pre-pregnancy state of less than 100 grams. Okay. As the uterus is uh, enlarged uh, because it has a baby uh, and after soon after delivery, uh, the postpartum uterus is about 1 kilogram and it returns to its pre-pregnancy state of less than 100 grams during this phase. So this is called a uterine involution. After delivery, uterus in fundus lies four centimeter below the umbilicus, like it is still an abdominal organ during the uh, soon after delivery. Like uh, soon after delivery, uh, you can feel palpate the uh, uterus just below the umbilicus. By two weeks, uterus no longer palpable above the symphysis pubis. Means after two weeks, it becomes uh, further shrinks in size and uh, it becomes uh, uh, it will be not be palpable and becomes a pelvic organ. It is a process. Uh, what happens in uterine evolution? It is a process of muscles are smooth muscle cells. So uh, during pregnancy, the muscle cells hypertrophies. Okay, they does not rep, uh, multiply. They just hypertrophies themselves themselves uh, during this uh, perperium and uh, during uterine involution what happens that the muscle cell, uh, cell size diminishes so that it returns to it uh, uh, returns to its normal size and become a pelvic organ okay the cervical changes what happens in the cervix first few days of delivery cervix admit two fingers like because there is a normal delivery uh, so the cervix is fully dilated and the baby, child is born. Uh, uh, soon after delivery, what happens? The cervix uh, 
con uh, becomes uh, uh, tries to come to its normal size, but st it, it still admits two fingers. By the end of two weeks, the internal losses close and the external loss remains open permanently. Okay, so in a Paris woman, you can uh, feel uh, if you feel the cervix, you will see uh, feel that the external loss is open and the internal loss is closed. So it is a sign that this is a uh, cervix of a ferrous woman like cervix becomes funnel shape okay this is the other cervical changes we done the uterine changes okay now the other thing is lochia what is lochia it is a blood stained uterine discharge which comprise of blood and necrotic decidua soon after delivery what uh, uh, because of preg uh, during pregnancy what happens that the uterine decidua enlarge in size and it accommodates the baby and the placenta gets adherent to the endometrium but after delivery and after delivery of the placenta what happens that the uh, uh, the inner endometrial lining it starts shedding lochia so it is a blood stain uterine discharge which uh, contains blood and necrotic reservoir okay the lochia with time lochia changes its color initially the lochia uh, is red in color so we call it lochia rubra in the initial first week it is lochia rubra then it changes in color to pink which is we call lochia alba okay so these are the different uh, uh, names of the lochia according to the its colors. Okay, next physiological change what happens is normal emotional psychological changes which happens in a woman after delivery. First is the postnatal pinks. What is it? For the first 24 to 48 hours following delivery, the sleeping. Like she is... Uh, in a good mood, she elevated mood, you can say. So we call it postnatal pinks. Mostly the patient, uh, the other uh, thing, uh, which uh, the other emotional change which happens is postnatal blues. Mostly the portion, uh, mostly the females after delivery, they feel postnatal blues. In the first two weeks following delivery, the patient will be fatigued. She will be short tempered, difficulty. She has difficulty, will have difficulty in sleeping, but depressed mood and tearful. Okay. Most females go through this postnatal blues during the first two weeks. Okay. And these postnatal blues resolve spontaneously. Okay. So these are the two, these are physiological changes which uh, you can see in a female. Okay. Other is breastfeeding. In perperium, what happens? Uh, okay, now we come to the breastfeeding. Okay, the what is the physiology behind breastfeeding? First, the estrogen causes stimulation. Uh, it stimulates the lactiferous duct proliferation. Okay, uh, these uh, also come in MCQs. What causes proliferation of the lactiferous ducts or which hormone causes so is the estrogen. Progesterone is responsible for the development of memory lobules okay these causes development of memory lobules and estrogen is causing the proliferation of the ducts so okay and what are the lactogenic hormones which causes milk production these are the prolactin and human placental lactogen the human placental lactogen comes from the placenta when the patient is in uh, last trimester these uh, this hormone is present and it causes milk production even before delivery okay next is the what is colostrum it is a yellowish fluid which is secreted by the breast and it is expressed at 16 week of pregnancy okay uh, uh, and it is replaced by the breast milk on the second postpartum day and what it contains it contains high concentration of pro uh, proteins less sugar and fat this is also important what uh, plostrum contains so it contains high proteins less sugar and less fat okay and which type of protein in the form of iga iga is the immunoglobulin which protects the baby against infections and uh, plostrum also has an laxative effect and it causes the emptying of the baby bowel with the first tool which is the meconium 
greenish stool which the baby passes so the claustrum is very healthy for the baby so most uh, patients uh, as the color is yellowish so they uh, think that it is not the actual milk so they avoid feeding the baby during the first two days so you have to counsel if you uh, you got a station on breastfeeding and the patient is coming to you and with uh, initial uh, on the day of delivery and she is avoid avoiding to feed the baby because of this yellowish fluid so you have to counsel her that this is healthy for the baby because it contains high proteins and the proteins are immunoglobulins which protect the baby from infection it has a laxative effect as well okay next is okay where are we okay now uh, first coming on with the breast milk then i will show you the comparison okay the female breast milk it contains more energy more fat and lactose and less protein so this is different from claustrum because it has less protein as compared to the claustrum so milk contains more energy more fat and lactose like um, means glucose and less protein and the protein is major protein is in the form like albumin other proteins are like globulin and caseinogen milk uh, breast milk also contains immunoglobulin including iga up uh, iga igm and igg breast milk also contains all vitamin except vitamin k this is important and this may come in mcq what which vitamin is not present or deficient in breast milk so it is vitamin k so we give vitamin k intramuscularly to the baby at the time of delivery to prevent the baby from hemorrhagic diseases okay so now uh, this is a uh, breast milk composition what it contains it contains more energy fat lactose less proteins what type of proteins is present like the albumin major form then like globulin and caseinogen uh, the, um, and the immunoglobulin which are present in breast milk are ig a m and g all sort of vitamin except vitamin k this is important okay now uh, there is a comparison between human and cow milk this is the chart from 10 teachers you can compare uh, the human milk from cow milk so this why i am showing you this because this helps you in counseling the patient if the patient is avoiding um, breastfeeding the baby and giving the baby a cow milk or some sort of other uh, treats apart from breast milk so you can counsel the patient that uh, see the human milk contains more energy it uh, it is high in calories as compared to cow milk and the lactose is more uh, like sugar uh, which is a milk sugar it is more as compared to cow milk protein is less while in cow milk protein is more which is not needed by the baby the fat content is more in human milk as compared to cow milk sodium content is less so it is uh, see you can see that uh, the cow milk contains 22 millimoles per liter of sodium while human milk contains 7 so if you give uh, cow milk to a uh, baby who is dehydrated so it will further cause uh, in a patient who uh, in a baby if you give uh, cow milk in a baby who has gastroenteritis so it will further cause dehydration because sodium attracts water okay so and the water content is equal but for your counseling you have to counsel about the benefits of breast milk this comes in your station as well okay so the what is uh, what are the hormones which causes milk production and milk ejection so the prolactin is a hormone which causes milk production it acts on the secretory cells and it synthesizes the uh, secretory cells in the breast and it causes synthesis of the milk all right then other hormone is oxytocin it causes milk ejection or let down it what uh, does oxytocin causes it contracts the myoepithelial cells surrounding the alveoli and causes expulsion of the milk the other role of oxytocin is on the uterus it causes uterine contraction and in order to prevent the patient from postpartum hemorrhage so these both hormones are coming from the pituitary say uh, the uh, oxytocin coming from the posterior pituitary and prolactin is coming from the anterior pituitary. Okay, now the advantages of breast milk, breastfeeding. What are the advantages? 
the advantages are uh, this is important for counseling uh, for uh, this station usually comes in oski that uh, you are you are participant to get connected and then we'll continue with the lecture think the benefits of a uh, be why breastfeeding is important for the for the mother and for the baby so the advantages of breastfeeding are that it can any uh, is there any voice issue can, do you all hear me am i kindly message me in the chat box if there is any problem okay okay so the advantages of breastfeeding what are the advantages so uh, what will you tell that it is readily available all the time okay uh, the uh, it has right temperature it is not extremely cold or hot and this is uh, it has ideal nutritional values okay it is cheaper because you don't have to buy go and buy the breast milk it is cheaper it is a contraceptive effect how contraceptive effect because what uh, prolactin causes milk production so this prolactin also causes suppression of the gonadotropins which in result uh, causes suppression of the ovulation so this has a contraceptive effect as well what are the long term association uh, what breast uh, the babies who are well breastfed uh, what happens they have uh, less number of morbidities and there is reduced necrotizing enterocolitis if the baby is preterm and the baby is on mother feet so there are reduced chances that the baby develops necrotizing enterocolitis childhood infection infective illness is less in breastfeeding why because the breast milk contain immunoglobulins iga so it prevents the baby from getting infection atopic illnesses like eczema asthma juvenile uh, diabetes childhood cancers and even for female pre menopausal breast cancers it prevents from all these things breastfeeding so these are the advantages main advantages okay uh, what other things that the uh, uh, because of breastfeeding there is a mother and child bonding as well okay next coming on to next slide contraception during per perium you will also counsel the patient regarding contraception so what are the different types of contraception the oral there are oral injectable intrauterine contraceptive devices and permanent contraception like sterilization including tubal ligation so oral oral contraception we can give progesterone only pill starting from day 21 we don't give ocps because there is a risk of thromboembolism and during breastfeeding we avoid giving estrogens so the we can give and we'll start it after 20, 21 days okay so uh, progesterone only pill there are injectables which uh, are depo provera these are three monthly injections given subcutaneously no uh, intramuscularly sorry nor steroid it is giving two monthly there is iucd intrauterine contraceptive device there are postpartum iucds the, that are placed soon after the delivery of the baby the, and the permanent method is tubal ligation okay if the baby is uh, if the mother is not breastfeeding so she can start taking pills from 3 weeks after delivery because in those patient because of not breastfeeding the effect of progest uh, prolactin is less so the patient can have ovulation soon by 4 to 6 weeks so she should start taking pills by 3 weeks after delivery okay now these were the physiological changes now we will come about uh, on abnormal per perium what are the abnormalities which a patient can face during per perium okay first abnormality is delayed involution like uh, as we discussed that in uh, ut uterus comes to its normal uh, pre pregnancy size so uh, there could be a delay in that there could be postpartum hemorrhage other is obstetric palsy symphysis pubis diastasis thromboembolism perperial pyrexia perperial sepsis which we call pre sepsis psychiatric disorders and breast disorders these are some abnormal things which can happen during the per perium okay coming on to delayed involution so what are the signs of delayed involution 
like if a patient is coming to you after uh, after two weeks and you still palpate the uh, you can still palpate the uterus above the symphysis pubis so as we discussed before that uh, after two weeks the uterus is no longer palpable above the symphysis pubis so what you will suspect if a patient is coming to you on a follow up visit and you do her per abdominal examination two weeks later after delivery uh, she has delivered and now you are still palpating the uterus uh, so it means she has delayed involution and what are the causes uh, what could be the causes like it could be artifact it could be a full bladder that you think it is a delayed involution or a loaded rectum or rpocs retained products of conception which are not letting the uterus to get contracted the other is uterine infection which we call endometritis the other thing is fibroids if the patient has uterine fibroids there would be delayed involution and broad ligament hematoma like patient has bleeding in the broad ligament and it, it enlarges inside and causing the delayed involution of the uterus okay other is postpartum hemorrhage we will be doing the obstetric hemorrhage in our sbl class um uh, while i uh, should uh, show you what is uh, there are two types of hemorrhages primary and secondary the primary is the bleeding from genital tract within 24 hours of delivery the secondary pps is bleeding from the genital tract between 24 hours and 6 weeks after delivery okay so this is primary and secondary after 24 hours secondary uh, before 24 hours is primary pps okay what are the causes of postpartum hemorrhage one is the endometritis that is there is uterine infection which uh, can lead to postpartum hemorrhage other is retained products of conception that the products are still inside and they cause the bleeding of the uterine uh, and metrium there could be bleeding disorders like von willebrand disease uh, okay and there could be choriocarcinoma Okay, the other thing obstetric palsy or traumatic neuritis. What happens in obstetric palsy? There's one or both lower limbs develop motor or sensory neuropathy. It could be motor, it could be sensory or both. Following delivery. Why? Due to damage of the proximal nerve of the lumbosacral plexus nerve tracts. What happens? Because of the uh, stretching, uh, when the baby head comes in the pelvis, it causes compression over the nerves and it causes a compression of the nerve plexus. So, uh, there could be damage in the proximal nerves, which are coming from the lumbosacral plexus. So, a patient can develop obstetric palsy. Okay, the, because of the uh, fetal head causes compression and these nerves cross uh, the pelvic brim and they get compressed and this is uh, mostly associated with prolonged or obstructed labor. Okay, so what are the presenting features? The patient can uh, develop sciatic pain, foot drop, she can have numbness, paresthesia, hypoesthesia, means decreased sensation. Uh, and muscle wasting. The other is symphysis pubis diastasis. It is a spontaneous separation of symphysis pubis. What is symphysis pubis? Pubis is a cartilaginous joint. So, uh, which uh, anteriorly it connects both the uh, hip bones. So, uh, there is a spontaneous separation of the symphysis pubis. This is rare. It can uh, it occurs in one in eight hundred vaginal deliveries. And uh, it is associated with forceps delivery, like if you apply an instrument, forceful delivery. So uh, the symphysis pubis get separated. And rapid second stage of labor, the the uh, baby delivers uh, rap, uh, soon in uh, primary gravida, like primary takes two hours during second stage and multi takes one hour. But if the baby delivers soon, so this can also be associated with symphysis pubis as well. And severe abduction of the thighs while placing the patient in a lithotomy position in during delivery if there is severe abduction of the thighs so there could be symphysis pubic diastasis okay next is what Achha. what are the signs and symptoms of it how will you know this is symphysis pubis diastasis there is symphysial pain. The patient gait will not be normal. It will be a waddling gait like duckling gait. 
pubic tendon is palpable inter pubic gap you can feel a gap between the pubic bones okay and there will be pubic tenderness okay treatment is what bed rest analgesic physiotherapy and pelvic corset like you have to keep the patient immobilized mobilized uh, in order uh, to get the uh, symphysis pubis joint to relocate okay what other thing can happen uh, what are abnormality can occur in uh, during perpineum it is thromboembolism the risk rises five fold during pregnancy and perpineum because pregnancy is considered as a hypercoagulable state so the risk of thromboembolism is more so there is a five fold rise in uh, risk of thromboembolism during pregnancy and perpineum okay the most common is after c section because after c section patient remain immobile uh, in the bed so there is risk that thromboembolism can occur in the legs like deep venous thrombosis okay if the patient is already at high risk of thromboembolism so you will give those patient thromboprophylaxis in the form of heparin okay what are the uh, methods you can prevent this by early mobilization like after cesarean section you will mobilize the patient in bed soon after she uh, uh, the paresthesia of the limbs uh, um uh, when the paresthesia of the limbs uh, diminishes and she uh, regains her sensation of the legs so you uh, uh, advise the patient to mobilize in bed and then get out of bed soon okay so early mobilization then hydration oral hydration is most important and providing the patient with dvt stockings deep in its from muscle prophylaxis stockings okay so these are the preventive methods okay then is perpineal paraxia what is it perpineal paraxia is the Temp this is important definition uh, you should know it is a temperature of 38 degree centigrade or higher the temperature can be more than 38 or th till 38 or higher on any two of the first 10 days postpartum if you find temperature at uh, at a time and then you again check the temperature uh, after a few hours and it is still 38 or higher okay during the first 10 days postpartum so this is perpineal pyrexia okay okay acha this is important that you exclude first 24 hours mean if the patient is developing fever during the first 24 hours it is not named as perpineal pyrexia perpineal pyrexia the according to definition it uh, starts after 24 hours because initially the patient uh, is uh, already in pain so she uh, pain and in distress so Uh, and we uh, give the patient some medication, which also causes uh, pyrexia. So during the first twenty four hours, it is not considered as perpineal pyrexia. But later on, if the patient is developing thirty eight degrees centigrade or higher on two, any two of the first ten days postpartum, it is considered pyrexia, perpineal pyrexia. Okay, excluding the first twenty four hours. Okay, the common side associated are uh, it the pyrexia the fever can be due to chest problem, throat problem, breast problems or urinary tract infections, any pelvic organ problems, cesarean and perineal wound like if you are giving episiotomy or there is a cesarean scar and legs like DVT. Okay, these also patient develop pyrexia. Okay, now the perpineal sepsis. What is the perpineal sepsis? It is a genital tract infection. following delivery okay this is because of the genital tract source it is polymicrobial means multiple uh, microorganisms are involved and can lead to maternal morbidity and mortality this is serious if because it is sepsis so it causes septicemia and uh, the infection arises from the genital tract okay it can lead to maternal morbidity and mortality okay this is important so you have to treat it the patient otherwise she uh, will end up in a mortality okay these are the organism this is a picture taken from 10 teachers okay uh, these are the organism commonly which are associated with perpineal genital infections these are aerobes and aerobes and miscellaneous in aerobes most common organism is beta hemolytic streptococci in which group a is the most virulent this is strep 
streptococcus uh, agalactia okay is most virulent and uh, is the most common organism causing perpetual sepsis other are streptococcus epidermidis s aureus enterococci in gram negative you will have e coli morphelis klebsiella pseudomonas okay and the other anaerobes are also there so it is a polymicrobial infection so the risk factors of perpetual infection what are the risk factor which patient can develop perpetual infections okay the uh, patient who have an underlying condition like obesity diabetes hiv like low immune uh, immunocompromised patients okay the other are antenatal patients who have chorioamnionitis okay the prolonged rupture of the membranes or patient had cervical cerclage due to cervical incompetence these are the, also the risk factor causing perpetual infection okay the other are intrapartum during labor the if the patient is having prolonged labor she can develop perpetual infection because you are doing per vaginal examination multiple times examination uh, this can lead to perpetual infection instrumental delivery c section because is a invasive uh, procedure manual removal of placenta and retained products of conception these are also a source of infection okay so these are the risk factor of perpetual infections okay cervical cerclage is uh, is sutures which we place in the cervix uh, uh, in patients who have cervical incompetence like if a patient has preterm deliveries painless deliveries uh, preterm and the uh, um, if you get an ultrasound you will find a shortening of the cervix so in order to prevent cervix from opening we put uh, sutures on in the cervix to keep it closed so this is cervical cerclage and we do it in the initial 14 to 16 weeks so this can also lead to infection now because you are putting uh, uh, stitches in the cervix okay what next okay what are the symptoms of uh, perpetual uh, infection okay there is malaise headache fever rigors okay patient can have these symptoms abdominal discomfort she can have vomiting diarrhea offensive lokia like there is foul smelling lokia okay because of infection genital tract infection she can develop secondary postpartum hemorrhage because of this infection uterine endometritis okay what are the signs you will find the patient is febrile she will be tachycardic if you palpate the uterus it will be boggy tender and larger in size and you can find an infected wound like infected episiotomy or infected cesarean scar what is the management you will manage in the in case of mild to moderate infection you will be giving treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics and if the infection is severe you will be admitting the patient in high dependency unit you will be giving high dose of broad spectrum antibiotic iv fluid you will be sending the cultures okay uh, cultures from where from the uh, urine cultures blood cultures and high vaginal swabs you will be sending uh, these all cultures to find out the source of the infection okay now it's coming on to the psychiatric disorders as we discussed that the postpartum pains and blues are the normal uh, psychological conditions which a female can go through but if the condition persists the patient can go in postpartum depression uh, about 10 to 15% uh, patients suffer from depression in the first year after delivery and uh, high risk patients are who those who have past history of depression they are at high risk of having postpartum depression okay the recurrence rate is 50% like if the patient had a uh, postpartum depression in a previous pregnancy so she is more prone to have postpartum depression in the current pregnancy as well the chances are 50% okay the this present around 6 weeks postpartum okay the depression occurs 6 weeks postpartum okay so uh, after 6 weeks follow up you will be assessing the signs of depression in that patient 
Okay, what are the symptoms? The patient will tell you that she uh, has poor sleep, early wake, morning wakening, she has poor appetite, she has uh, swinging of moods, sometimes she is happy, sometimes she is uh, sad, diurnal mood variation, low energy, she does not feel, uh, she has lack of interest in, in everything, impaired concentration, tearfulness, she always feel like crying, feeling of guilt, anxiety, and thoughts of self-harm or harm to the baby. So these are the alarming symptoms that you, you just suspect that the patient is in postpartum depression and you have to treat such patient because they can harm themselves and they can harm their baby as well. Okay. And they can uh, have relationship problems as well because of their depression. So you have to treat this depression. Okay, what are the treatment? Remedy of social factors, like if she has socially deprived, she should be have social gatherings with uh, people or uh, she should be uh, coming for the counseling, non-directed counseling, interpersonal psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy in which uh, the psychotherapist will be counseling her and lastly the drugs. Drug therapy including the tricyclic antidepressants and serotonin uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors these are the drugs which we can be giving uh, in the uh, depression postpartum depression okay there is postpartum psychosis which is a very severe disorder and it occurs in one in 500 to 1000 women after delivery and what are the risk factor of psychosis uh, if the patient has previous history of perpetual psychosis history of depressive illness, family history of bipolar disorder or psychosis. So these patients can develop perpetual psychosis and the recurrence is one in two. Okay. The symptoms, these uh, symptoms occur abruptly. The patient um, uh, says that she has restlessness, insomnia, like she is uh, difficulty in sleeping, uh, confusion, fear, she has delusion, hallucinations, um, fear of eating and drinking, failure of eating and drinking, sorry. Thoughts of self-harm, guilt, self-worthiness and hopelessness. So these are the uh, symptoms which uh, represent postpartum psychosis. So in postpartum psychosis, this is a severe condition. It, although it is rare, but it's a severe condition. So you have to treat these patients by admitting them, okay? You should refer them immediately to the psychiatrist. The, they should be admitted in a psychiatric unit. And the treatment is acute ph pharmacotherapy with neuroleptic like chloro, uh, chlorpromazine and haloperidol. Treating if the patient is having maniac attacks, you should be treated with lithium, electroconvulsive therapy and antidepressant. Okay, and in these patient antidepressants, uh, if you start antidepressant, it takes 10 to 14 days to be effective and you have to give the treatment for six months. Okay, and now other thing is breast disorders. Okay, there is, uh, what are the breast disorders we will be discussing? We discuss about breastfeeding. So there are some disorders which patient can complain uh, on follow. Uh, first is the blood stain nipple discharge, which we call rusty pipeline. Uh, like rusty, uh, when you, uh, there is a pipeline with rusty color. So it is blood stain nipple discharge. And why it happens? It is due to endometrial, it is due to epithelial proliferation and is self-limiting and lasts for one week. Like if the pipeline is not in being in use and uh, if you open the tap and there initially there is a rusty color uh, water coming out. So like that, there is a blood stain nipple discharge initially in the first week that is called rusty pipeline. Okay, and this is not rust, it is due to an epithelial proliferation. Okay, the other thing is painful nipples. Patient can also come with complaint of she has pain in the nipples and this is usually due to crack nipples. And why crack nipples happens? This is due to poor positioning and candidal thrush. Okay, so uh, she developed pains. As the baby sucks the nipples, she developed pain in the nipple and there is difficulty in uh, feeding the baby. So what is the treatment? The local antibiotic ointment, analgesic and resting. And there are nipple shields available which can be used uh, uh, to apply and then feeding the baby. Okay. The other thing is galactosine. 
what is galactosine this is a sterile milk filled retention cyst of the mammary ducts why does it happen this is due to blockage of the uh, blockage of the uh, glands or uh, uh, ducts uh, due to blockage of the ducts by thick secretions so what happens that the when the ducts are blocked the milk uh, the uh, in the there is uh, development of a cyst filled with milk in the mammary ducts okay if there is a blockage in the distal side so this also resolves spontaneously okay the other thing is breast engorgement this this breast engorgement is what the, this engorgement of the breast the size of the breast enlarges and uh, why this happens because the patient is not feeding her baby so the breast gets engorged so the, this can also result in puerperal fever like uh, we discussed perpetual pyrexia so this can also happen due to breast engorgement so what is the treatment there is manual expression okay yeah, the patient should be advised she should manually express out the milk from the breast uh, she should be uh, uh, applying fitted bras using fitted bras using ice bags and using breast pump in order to uh, take out the breast milk uh, from the breast okay the other is mastitis it occurs when uh, what is mastitis it is an inflammation of the uh, breast it occurs when the blocked duct obstructs the milk flow and distend the alveoli okay and causes inflammation so the most common organism is isorius and the treatment is what breast massage and analgesic and antibiotic okay so these are the breast disorders so we have covered all the uh, disorders um, abnormal peripheral disorders okay we will starting from let me go on the slide these are the abnormal peripheral so we discuss delayed involution we discuss postpartum hemorrhage obstetric palsy symphysis pubis diastasis thromboembolism peripheral pyrexia sepsis psychiatric disorders and breast disorders we have covered this abnormal peripheral okay okay the last is perinatal death okay what is stillbirth okay we was discussed stillbirth is a baby born with no signs of life okay what is perinatal stillbirth it is a stillbirth more than 24 week gestation or death within 7 days of birth okay perinatal death is from the time more than 24 week gestation till 7 days of within 7 days of birth this is including perinatal death okay these are the some definition in the perpetuum you can uh, read the topic from the 10 teachers because i have made this uh, presentation from 10 teachers and it is your te textbook as well so you should go through the per chapter of perpetuum it will be more easier for you to understand okay if anyone has any query they can message me in the chat box okay perinatal death is what perinatal death uh, is um, still birth more than 24 week gestation like 24 weeks is considered as the age of viability for the fetus and uh, it until death within 7 days of birth early neonatal uh, period uh, uh, death is also included in this so this is perinatal death yes rusty pipeline syndrome is the red uh, the milk color is reddish in color so this is rusty pipeline syndrome it no perinatal death is a range okay 
it contains uh, it con uh, the deaths after 24 weeks and till uh, first seven days is included in perinatal heading of perinatal death. Still, birth is uh, when the baby has no sign of life after the age of viability, like to, after 24 weeks. Then, still birth is further divided into uh, fresh still birth and macerated still birth. Okay, I should come on to the learning objectives. Uh, I think we have covered all. Uh, you should be knowing the now, you should be knowing the definition of perpirium, what are the physiology of normal perpirium, what are the abnormalities in perpirium, and the diseases we discuss. Yes, uh, see postpartum cervical changes in cesarean delivery. Okay, in cesarean delivery, if the patient is undergoing cesarean section in a labeling patient, like the patient is not getting, uh, the patient is having a, uh, obstructed labor, and then you are going for cesarean section, then you will be having the same finding as a normal delivery patient of the cervix. Like uh, initially, the cervix is admitting two fingers, then the internal os get closed, but the external remain open, uh, which is a sign of a Paris movement. Okay. In a uh, caesarean section, if you are doing an elective caesarean section and the patient uh, has not gone through labor uh, and the cervix is not di uh, dilated, so, uh, so uh, what happens that the cervix is not funnel shape, okay? But the cervix, uh, the size of the cervix get reduced as compared to a normal laboring patient why because when you when you open the open the uterus uh, from a lower fancy uh, lower transverse incision and you closes it so a portion of the cervix is uh, retracted upwards okay so the cervix is uh, when you do a pervaginal examination in those patients you find cervix higher up okay okay this is obstetric palsy Okay. You have any confusion on obstetric palsy? Okay, I should show you the presenting feature as well. Patient have these symptoms in obstetricy. <laughs> okay, it's 10 a.m. now. I think the class time is over. If you have any queries, you can ask me later on as well. Okay, thank you class. I hope you understand the lecture and you will be reading it from 10 teachers as well. Okay, thank you.